It's great to see you all here for this second installment of, of Not on the Test. And we'll, we'll keep that promise. Uh, I wanted to say a few words about MSRI before we begin. Uh, MSRI is a nonprofit institution uh, located on the Berkeley campus. We act by gathering large groups of mathematicians from all over the world to come and work on specific subjects within mathematics. Each semester we run two. For example, this semester it's general relativity. That's a mathematical subject these days. And uh, something called optimal transport, which is indeed how to get things from here to there in the best possible way. And it turns out to be a, a major and basic uh, kind of structure in mathematics. We bring people together and they love to come because mathematicians are actually rather gregarious and like to collaborate with each other. In their home institutions, there might be just a few people in a given field, but when they come to MSRI, uh, it becomes the center of the, of the mathematical universe in that field for the semester. And there are lots of people to talk about about their favorite programs, favorite problems. That's also, in a way, why we're here tonight. Uh, mathematicians love what they do. They think it's very beautiful and exciting and attractive and are rather surprised that not everybody agrees with them all of the time. <laughs> so <laughs> we like to show off how nice these things can be, and these public lectures are an attempt in that direction. We're supported by the government and by private individuals. We owe uh, this evening's uh, support to the Simons Foundation and their generosity, and uh, they're funding this series and also generously a number of other programs uh, for the public in mathematics around the country as well as a great deal of research in mathematics and physics, computer science, and uh, medical matters, too. So without further ado, let me talk about Keith Devlin. Keith got his training in England. He was at King's College for his undergraduate and at Bristol for his PhD. Worked in logic and foundations. He's gotten, however, uh, into an expert position on public understanding of mathematics. He's the author of more than 34 books and 80 articles. He's the math guy. Some of you have heard him in that guise on NPR. And he's won prizes for these works. He was awarded the Carl Sagan Prize for Science Popularization, the Joint Policy Board for Mathematics Communications Award. That needs a better name to communicate, I think. <laughs> and uh, is recognized by the state of California, even, in its infinite interest in intellectual things. <laughs> uh, he wrote somewhere that video games rely on a different set of mechanics than other forms. And to suggest that games are merely attempts to recreate something is like saying that the purpose of film is to document, or that the only thing that literature should do is to tell stories that are true. To think about video games in such a mechanistic term is to deny the potential of the form. So tonight, I think we'll hear about an expansion of that potential. And without further ado, Keith Devlin. Thanks. OK. Um, if you're over 40 and haven't played video games, please raise your hand. OK, that's quite a lot, yeah. I, I didn't, you know, the reason I excluded the under 40s is the concept, do not play a video game, simply does not exist. It's not in the lexicon. Um, in fact, that the reason I began to get interested in educational uses of video games was precisely because of that data that came out of the Pew Foundation that pointed out that by the time a kid today graduates from high school, they have spent more time in games and game-like environments than they have in the classrooms total. So there's the time available. You know, this, this, this is, this, you, it's a zero-sum game when you when you want to do something new with your life, you stop doing something else. And so there's so many demands on people's times that for those of us who care about education, the only way to sort of get into the time that's available is to embed it in video games. And that becomes very, very interesting and challenging. 
Uh, I'm going to be focusing on essentially the mathematics of middle school level. And it's not really mathematics. I'm one of these people that would call this sort of quantitative literacy, logical reasoning, analytic reasoning, um, basic everyday skills. There's a collection of topics or abilities that are really part of the literacy of living in the modern society. Uh, you know, you can't live in society and function well if you can't read and write and have a good facility with language, ideally with at least one, with two, at least two languages, one second language. And you can't really function well in society if this kind of stuff isn't part of your cognitive apparatus. It's not the kind of thing you stop doing something and pull out a pencil. It's the stuff that's the way you interact with the world. The world we live in, the very act of dealing with that world, and minute by minute, you've got to have this kind of stuff right at your fingertips or your eyeballs. So these are the basics, part of the basic skills of life in the 21st century. Uh, it does roughly fall into the middle school level, which is the, the, the time of the big cliff. That's when students run along and drop out of first mathematics and then science, and we end up with these crises in the STEM disciplines. So this is the stuff that's important. It's the stuff that is going on in the classrooms when kids uh, drop out of the subject. So there are very good reasons why you would want to look at this if you wanted to have an impact on society. And that's really what I was trying to do when I got into this business, was use video games which are reaching the almost the entire audience, at least 97% of kids of that age are playing a lot of video games. Incidentally, I'm, I keep, I'm going to be using the term educational video game. Um, the word educational is completely superfluous there. There is no such thing as a non-educational video game. A video game simply provides you with a bit of information, provides you with a challenge, and then tests you immediately. I mean, kids say they don't like testing, but video games are all about being tested moment by moment by moment. And then you get a little squirt of dopamine every time you get it right, so you feel good. So it's just a, you're on a cycle of new information, challenge, practice, test, challenge, practice, test. And that's what goes on in a video game. The only question is, what are you learning? Are you learning how to kill monsters, steal automobiles, or solve equations? So um, <laughs> those three don't need to be disjoint. Um, and that's part of the trick. OK, so that's the focus. So when I talk about, and I'm using the phrase everyday math to just mean that, but this is really the focus of the whole thing. Um, in terms of video games, if you go into the App Store or go into any site, you'll find a lot of games listed as, as educational video games, math educational video games. The vast majority are really just a modern version of flashcards. They're, they're designed to give you practice at mastering your number bonds, the various tables, basically basic number facts, little bits of, of algebra and so forth. They're practice at sort of internalizing and chunking information about everyday mathematical skill sets. Um, the vast majority do that. The vast majority are actually aimed at very young children. And they basically provide this, uh, I mean, the pedagogic model is basically the, the, the wheel that your hamster runs around. You just put the kid in this thing, and it runs around and, and, and practices these basic skills. Um, here's one that I kind of like. It's a fairly old one now. It's called Time's Attack. And it was a first-person shooter. And you kill the monsters by correctly answering the multiplication problems. Um, now, you know. It's kind of hokey, right? Because there's no connection. I mean, you know, the one thing we do know is you don't kill people by answering multiplication problems <laughs> like that. You put them to sleep, you bore them, but you don't kill them that way. Um, so there's actually no connection between the mathematics and the game. They're just disjointed things. This is a forced marriage of two domains, of basic classical mathematics expressed symbolically. This is, a st and I'm going to be talking a lot about representations. Classical representation. It's a PC game. You play it on a computer. You type in the answer. And if you get the answer right, the monster dies. And then another monster comes at you. And by the time you've played that, for, you know, put a kid in that for two hours, they will know, they will know all of the, the number bonds. That's basically the vast majority. Just basic repetition of, 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 of simple skill sets. Um, a little bit more, well, quite a bit more sophisticated is where people take, and this is a relatively recent game that got funding from the National Science Foundation, a company based in Taos, New Mexico, high school teacher um, developed this over many years. He actually started with the idea of standard mathematics with a textbook. There's a textbook here. Um, and built a game world around it. It was a sort of find your way around in the, in the, in, in the, in the Southwest. It was in the Southwest deserts. Uh, there's a Native American princess with a pet wolf. 
who's trying to find her, her grandfather, and she has to na navigate around uh, by the stars, by, by planning her way out, doing all sorts of trigonometry and, and, and calculations, mixing herbs, uh, collecting sort of herbs and mixing potions to heal herself. So she's faced with lots of mathematics. It's really recreating the ancient days of the mariners navigating the Mediterranean or wandering across the continent where they had to plan their route. So the idea there is to create a game around the mathematics. Um, but the mathematics is still very traditional. It's presented in paper and pencil form with a textbook. Um, the reason this, I, I would say this is a much better one than this because there is clearly a connection between the mathematics and the video game. And there's a, there's a number of those. That's just one that I particularly like. <laughs> but it's, it's, as I'm going to try and convince you, it misses the huge potential of video games. I mean, this is, these are sort of like when people started to learn to fly. And, you know, and the first thing you did is you sort of tried to put wings on and you flap your wings. And then you put a bicycle there because that gives you locomotion and you flap your wings. And you can get off the ground for a little bit, but you're not really flying because it took doing a lot of research to figure out how to make heavy devices lift off the ground. Um, but they're, they're, they're okay. I mean, these, these are two games. I, I'm not going to put, I'm, these are the only two video games I'm going to show except the one I've developed myself. These are games that I think are pretty darn good games. But they are first and second generation games. I think we've reached enough understanding now that we can go much beyond that and do something really quite remarkable with video games. <coughs> and to do that, I want to ask a question. What does it mean to do mathematics? So here we've got Matt Damon in Goodwill Hunting. He was young once, wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, OK. Um, Where is the mathematics being done? I mean, what is mathematics? Is the mathematics being done in that guy's head? Or has it been done on the wall? Where is the mathematics? Or is it both? Um, so I want to think about what it means to do mathematics. What's involved in doing mathematics? Certainly, it's very hard to do mathematics without one of these things. That's why in universities around the world, you'll find in the mathematics department or at MSRI, there are actually blackboards we can use with chalk. Turns out mathematics doesn't go as well with a whiteboard and, a, and, an, and an erasable pen. It just doesn't work as well. Um, something, in the, in the, something in the chalk. Uh, OK. okay um, another question. Is that mathematics? Or is the mathematics really going on in someone's head when that person interacts with that? So where is the mathematics? What does it mean? Well, I'm going to answer that question in a minute. But let me do that by, first of all, thinking of another question. Where's the music? Is that music? Or do you find music there? That's the music. There's where the music is. It's over here. What we've got here is a static representation of music. It's a pretty useful static representation, and for many generations, that was the only effective way of storing it and distributing it so you could sort of pass it around. Um, but the music was here. Music is something that takes place in time. It's an activity. You enjoy it. You play it. You experience it. This is just a static representation. Now, nobody... I mean, you know, the word music is used ambiguously. We sometimes do talk about this as the music. But in terms of what music is, it's clearly over there. It's when a person interacts with an instrument or with their voice and, and maybe has some sheet music. Okay. But aside from the way we use the language, no one would confuse the two. And yet people habitually confuse representations of mathematics with the activity of mathematics. We've got representations of mathematics, and we've got stuff going on in our heads. You can do mathematics without this. Not very well, but you can do it. You can't do it at all without that. It's in the head. It's almost like a musician who can sight read music, who looks at the music and doesn't see the notes, but hears the music in his or her head. And for a mathematician, you, go from, you, you, you read straight through, and this is sort of standard calculus, so it's, it's, it's relatively accessible. You, a mathematician, and that's probably most people in the audience, can just look at that 
And it's not the squiggles and the symbols. They just know what this stuff means. And it happens in the head. And it's the happening in the head that's really the activity of mathematics. So we need to distinguish between mathematics and its representation. And representations matter. I mean, Gauss is supposed to have said it's about notions, not notations. And I think he did say that. But you've got to be very careful how you interpret that. Because representations clearly make a big difference. It's really hard to do multiplication and division if you're representing numbers in Roman numerals. But when the Hindu-Arabic number system moved into Italy in the 13th century, one of those 34 books David mentioned was actually a book about that transition at the beginning of the 13th century. Within a century of Hindu-Arabic arithmetic arriving in, in Europe, in, in essentially in Tuscany and Lombardia, we have all of modern finance been developed. Double entry bookkeeping, um, the, 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 the working out interest, division of profits, all of the stuff of modern finance, including banks, um, in, including insurance, you know, the words policy and bank are from the Italian. All of the modern financial system came in, in, in the world, in the Western world, came out of Tuscany and Lombardia in the 13th century. And what the trigger was, they got hold of this, which means that an individual person can do calculations without the need of an expert using an abacus board or fancy finger calculation. So the, the, the modern world owes itself in its lineage to the fact that there's this very efficient way of doing arithmetic developed in India in the first few centuries of the, of the current era, then taken by the Arabic Persian speaking people for several hundred years, developed, uh, moved around with it, um, mainly for trading purposes. They were very tra were trading and engineering. And then it crossed the Mediterranean into Europe. And by then, society was at a stage where it could really take that idea and run with it. Um, just for reference, to sort of take us back to that lineage, there's one of the representations. There were, there were a number of different, slightly different representations of those numerals I in Arabic. OK, but that was a huge difference, enormous difference when you had a different representation. The numbers were the same. You know, number three is the number three is the number three. But the representation can make a huge difference. And the representation, not just a symbol, but how the symbols put together. It's the whole structure of the symbols. And it's not just numbers, but it also happens with computing. I mean, you know, um, I, I knew there'd be a fairly elderly audience here, including myself. So I thought I'd, I'd give us all a warm, fuzzy feeling <laughs> <laughs> with MS-DOS and a very early version of the Macintosh. Didn't that warm the heart, right? Well, that one warms the heart. That one gives me the sheepers, actually. But, um, OK. But you know, I mean, that was what made computing a commercial success in, in the sense of a consumer product. That was a consumer product once that thing came out. Um, whole generations of people who were not computer types suddenly found that they were. You know, behind the screen, the same stuff is going on. In fact, in the case of Windows, when, when Microsoft sort of put a front on that called Windows, the same stuff actually was going on in the background. Um, but the interface made a difference. So interfaces matter, representations make a difference. <laughs> And in the case of mathematics, for many hundreds of years, we've had essentially the same kind of representation. You know, mathematics is the subject that was given to us on stone tablets, or at least clay tablets. Um, goes way back, at least to Babylonia. This is a Babylonian tablet around 2500 BCE. Um, then an Egyptian one, the Rhind Papyrus. Um, this, I think, was um, a page from Omar Khayyam. Uh, from that era. And then this is a page from Libra Abaci, the book that uh, Leonardo of Pisa or Fibonacci wrote in 1202. That's actually a page from the 1224, a copy of the 1224 edition. But that was uh, the book that essentially brought arithmetic into the Western world. But it's essentially the same stuff. It's symbolic representations. And it's static. Now, we've got to be aware of the fact that our image of mathematics is conditioned by the fact that for hundreds of years it's been presented to us as something static, encoded in symbols on a piece of paper. Just like music, except with music, we have always had a second channel, which is the auditory system. We've always heard music. So we've never fallen into the trap of identifying the music with the notation. But people do regularly think of that 
as the mathematics. Learning mathematics is learning how to manipulate symbols. When it, in, in our generation, when there was a, when, it, when even when television was beginning, when I was growing up, you know, those were kind of exciting, right? I mean, I still find that kind of exciting. But for someone who's used to a different kind of representation, this is going to look kind of old. Right? Um, <laughs> and this is the modern version of it. Okay, so today we're used to the fact that mathematics is expressed symbolically, um, often in coloured ink, because people like coloured ink and it's easy to do. But there's sort of what we think of as the way mathematics is represented. And of course, that's very powerful. That's an unbelievably powerful way of doing stuff. If you can master that stuff, it's very, very powerful. But for someone learning it, that actually is a bit of a problem. And it's an unnecessary problem. It was a necessary problem all the time. The only way to store and distribute the mathematical knowledge was symbolic representation. And that's hundreds and many hundreds of years. But if you have a different representation, one that's dynamic, interactive, possibly has a 3D effect, is experiential, can be tactile, can give tactile feedback. If you've got all of that in a possible representation, all of a sudden, symbols on a static page begin to look terribly old. They're not going to get lost. Those are going to be absolutely essential for doing a lot of stuff. But if you're talking about providing basic everyday mathematical thinking skills for the population at large, the vast majority of which will never need to know that, then there's no need to force them through that way. Because we do know that people have so much difficulty with this stuff that they drop off before they master the basic numerical skills. You know? And you have this problem where people think that a 30% reduction in price this week followed by a 30% increase in price next week means the price goes back the same. You, know? you don't have to put up your hand whether you believe that or not. <laughs> um, but it doesn't go back to the same. Okay. And the reason, I mean, we know quite concretely for work that was first of all done in, in South America, uh, and then similar experiments were performed actually by Jean Lave here at UC Berkeley. There's a phenomenon that I've been calling it the symbol barrier. That's my terminology, but this is something that's been known since the early 1990s. And the, the, the seminal study that got this off the ground was carried out in, 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 in the marketplaces of Brazil, in, in receipt in Brazil, in the early, part, early 1900s. And a group of researchers, social scientist types, went round the marketplace watching and recording, audio recording and then transcribing, transactions with young children who were looking after market stalls. And what they found was when they presented these kids, and they, they posed as shoppers, when they presented them with problems involving quite sophisticated addition and subtraction. You know, you buy 11 coconuts and you pay with a large bill. So that the, the, this, 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 this kid who's looking after the stall has to do 11 times the price, the unit price, and then subtract it from the bill. Turned out that of these kids, the average score of getting it right was 98%. It's essential for a human being. They were perfect. Just minimal errors in doing this. Um, actually, they didn't do it by adding and subtracting. They developed on the fly, uh, over, the, over some, some period, they developed very sophisticated algorithms for doing this, um, using, a, using pretty well all of the operations of arithmetic. So 98% was the accuracy rate of people doing fairly sophisticated arithmetic. The other part of the experiment was visiting them later in their homes with the parents around, and in the, in the quiet and peace of the home, with paper and pencil, and nothing at stake, this is not high stakes testing, this was low stakes testing, they presented them with what essentially were the same arithmetical problems, and the success rate was 37%. The same mathematical problems. Well, if you can decode and read that, you know it's the same problem. So if you start over there with mastery, you can recognize what's going on here. But these kids had got mastery over here, and that was a foreign language. So to them, they were not the same problem. And so we've known now since the early 90s, and as I say, it's been done many times with different, audience, different groups of people, that there's a huge problem when people are presented with mathematics in symbolic form. If the mathematics is meaningful, it's motivating, and it's in a real life context, if you're doing something with your body maybe, or with, certainly with your mind, you can get very accurate. If it's abstract and decontextualized, you can't, or most people can't. 
So this is an enormous difference. So certainly, in point, from the perspective of getting people ready for life in society, making this the entry point, when that's the goal for most people, is absolutely the wrong way around. It's like taking a funnel upside down and trying to pour the water into the funnel through the narrow end. Most of it spills over the side, which is what we find in our education system. If we'd only turn the funnel upside down, everybody goes in the top, and then they trickle down. Not everyone comes out at the, at the same speed, but it's the right way to do it. So if we have a way of developing our educational system for the middle school level this way, then the people that are able to do it and want to will, will achieve that, but everybody will master the stuff on the left. And right now, as we well know, the vast majority of people, or a substantial number of people, never really master the, the everyday stuff. So there are good reasons for trying to circumvent the symbol barrier. So the lessons, the take-homes are, by the way, that's the, that's the book, that's a recent version of the book that was done. The authors called it Street Mathematics, and they basically observed the fact that this is actually, algorithmically it's different, and it's actually cognitively very different. I mean, clearly it is, because the answers are so different. So the evidence is clear that it's not that people don't have the mathematical brain, which you could deduce from natural selection anyway. Right? Um, you know, most people can, if they put their mind to it, can finish a marathon. It doesn't mean to say you're an Olympic marathon runner, but if you can move one leg in front of the other and you train, you're on the spectrum. The problem, however, is symbolic representation. So we do know one of the big problems, which brings me back to the idea of the piano. If you wanted to learn about music, and you sign up for a school, a music school, and you want to learn about music, you'd be kind of upset if, they were, if you were told that you're going to spend six years mastering this. And when you've passed all the theoretical exams, someone would sit you in front of one of these things and start playing it. You don't do that. You go to a music that you're going to want to learn, and, you, and you, you pick an instrument, very often the piano, and you start to play. You learn by playing. It doesn't make things like playing. It actually, you know, the word play is ambiguous, but, but, but valuably ambiguous, because you start to play. You sit there, and it's fun and you get better and better and better. And the reason is this. Remember, music is that stuff, the stuff that we listen to, that we create. It's the stuff that's sort of in our heads, in our, in our sensory system, our emotional system. This is probably the world's worst interface to music, except for what it was designed to do. I mean, quite. I don't read that. I, 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 with a lot of difficulty, can decode this because I know I've been taught the rules. But I can't look at that, and it doesn't. It really doesn't mean anything to me. It's hard work learning to sort of decode that stuff. But if you sit at a piano and you start practicing, you can start to play. Of course, the, the music doesn't go away. It's, it, it can be very useful to have the music. But we expect to learn, and people do learn by actually playing it, because this is a really good interface to music. You can feel the music. You can feel the vibrations. You can feel the stuff. Um, you can feel it digitally. If you have a violin, you can feel it analog fashion. You can feel the music. Uh, you can, the resonance is just part of your body. So this is a wonderful interface to music. Um, I'm not a good pianist. Uh, I used to play drums when I was a student. But when I sit at an instrument, I'm clearly interacting with the music. It's not mediated by these things. And so when we founded our video games company a few years ago, um, we, this was a sort of a design principle. Um, we didn't articulate it back then, but this was sort of, it was certainly at the back of my mind, that we should have, uh, think of instruments for, for playing music and for learning music by playing instruments, and think of video games as a device that can be used as an instrument on which you can play some mathematics. Uh, I mean, I, one remark before we get to it, like all metaphors and analogies, it's, got, it's good, but it has limitations. You buy one of these, you can play almost any music. I mean, not make the same sound, but you can buy any music, and you can play it on the piano. Uh, it turns out when you start to think in terms of video games, you can't, at least I don't think, there's an analog of a piano on which you can play all the mathematics. We're really talking about building orchestras. Um, and it's even more complicated than that. But I think the, the metaphor is a valuable one if you start to design video games the right way, because the idea is to bypass a representation 
which is a historical accident. Symbolic representations for middle mathematics, for this everyday mathematics, remember that original, all of those, th 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 those ta tag cloud? None of those things in the tag cloud at the middle school level require symbolic representations. It's stuff you do in your head. You can close your eyes and deal with that stuff. That's why it's everyday stuff. Okay? So linking that to the, the classical representation is a historical accident. That was the, that, so that's a limitation of the media, the medium we had at the time. We now have the ability to build the equivalent of pianos. <laughs> and when you think of it that way, just think of the advantages of learning by playing a piano, learning music by playing a piano. First of all, you're actually doing the real thing. You're not learning something that will eventually lead you to play music. You begin by playing music, pretty badly at first, but you get better and you get the feedback. So you're doing the real thing from day one. It's the same device. The inter once you've mastered the interface, you can take it all the way through from your bedroom at home in Mountain View or whatever, all the way to Carnegie Hall, if you get that far. So the same device will carry you all the way through. It gives you a sense of direct connection to the music. The feedback is instant. You know, without being taught, if you hit the wrong note. Your ears say, ugh. And not only that, but it says, ugh, because you were too far to the left, or ugh, because you were too far to the right. Even without training, you very quickly get the feedback and you can control what's going on. So you get that, it's instant. You don't need somebody else to teach you. The, the, at least in the beginning, the music teacher is there to sort of give you advice and help you, not to judge you. That comes later, if you go that far. But, um, so the piano tells you you're wrong. The, the music teacher isn't your enemy at that stage. The piano is your enemy, except it doesn't feel like an enemy. You're just playing it. You know that you've screwed up, but you try to do it better. It tells you how you get it wrong. You can gauge your own progress. You know how well you're doing. That instructor sitting there is a guide, not the arbitrator of right or wrong. And this is what I would say adaptive learning should mean. All too often, what adaptive learning means, you're playing a, vid in, in, say a video game, you're playing a game, and you can't solve this problem. So the game stops, and it says, go away and do this tutorial and come back. Give me a break, come on. Um, adaptive learning, there is, if you think of a device and a human being, there is an incredibly good adaptive learner there. It's a human being. You know, we are the, of all the creatures on the planet, we are the supreme adaptive learners. That's our big natural selection act advantage. We adapt, we change our behavior very rapidly. We get dopamine rewards when we do it successfully. So adaptive learning, what it should mean is you provide the ability for the player, whatever they're doing, to adapt what they're doing. You're playing a piano tune and it's too difficult. What do you do? You don't throw the piano away. You don't go away and buy a piano with fewer keys. You step back and play a simpler tune. Or you take that tune and you put it into pieces and you play it more slowly. And you practice it and practice it and then you build up the tempo. You adapt because you are well equipped to adapt. The piano doesn't need to have artificial intelligence behind it, checking how well you do. Could do, that could, that could, that could improve matters, but it doesn't need to do it because you can do the adapting. Okay, so here we've got a device that seems perfectly made for learning about music through learning to play an instrument. All of the things that you need. There's no reason why we can't take every one of those ideas and build games around mathematics. The way to do it would be to take a piece of mathematics, build a game around it, thinking of the game structure as a representative medium for representing that mathematics. The example I'm going to give you, which is the, the, the first game we released a few weeks ago, is, is in the area of arithmetic. It was a good first one to release. Uh, it's actually built on some interesting mathematical ideas I'll, I'll just at least allude to. But the idea was to take arithmetic where you can do, what can you do? You can add, you can subtract, you can multiply. This was, this was integer arithmetic, and so we're not, we're not going to be worried about division at this stage. But you can add, multiply, and subtract. And so we took those ideas and said, well, that's a structure where stuff happens, where you do things to them. Let's devise a device that represents that 
without using the symbols. Okay. So this was the question. Fill in the diagram. This is to that as that is to that. The equivalent of a piano for playing mathematics. Where again, the word play um, meaningfully has that, that duality. Here it is. Okay, now let's just dissect what we've just seen, because that went through pretty quickly. But we did pretty well. We got three stars. It was only the second puzzle in the game. So it does get a little bit more difficult than that. Um, and in fact, I'm going to talk about the, the one that would come next. Okay. Because here we've got the problem. This is, the, this is the, the one that we just saw. You've got this little creature called a wuzzit who's got trapped in this thing here. And you, your job as a player is to free... The, but you know, I'm not going to be talking about solving equations. Um, I'm not going to be talking about solving integer partitions. I'm not going to be talking about solving Diophantine equations. Uh, but yes, I am. It's just that they don't look the same. Okay. We're going to be solving certain mathematical problems built around the idea of addition, multiplication, and subtraction. Addition and multiplication, essentially. Although you can go both ways. Okay, so the idea is to free this was it. The was it's got trapped. There are keys in an early game. There's just one key, and there's a slot up there. We're going to put the key in. So we have to. Our job is to get the key to free the was it. And they're on a big thing. This one is actually at point number ten. We can't rotate the big wheel, but we can rotate a little cog. There's going to be more cogs, but at the beginning there's just one cog. This is very simple, one variable stuff. Start with one variable, build up. Okay, we're going to build up to four variables much faster than we do typically in the schools. Um, and the idea is this, you've got a cog here which will rotate it through five. So if we wanted to rotate it to get ten, we could do a five and then a five. Now, as with all games, once you start to play it, things get, you, you get new challenges. Okay, so we've got a drive cog, and we've got a key, which is the target. One thing you can do in the game, and this is like playing a two-finger exercise. The first time you play, sit a child in front of the piano, they probably try a twinkle, twinkle, little star with one or two fingers. This is the two-finger exercise for twinkle, twinkle, little star. The twist that's going to come in as, as, as anyone plays this game is that as you play it, by the way, you're what, this is a free download from the App Store. There's an Android version on the way. I'm going to show you a couple of very simple cases. I'm going to give you a glimpse of a more difficult one. And I will literally, anyone who thinks that what I've said is trivial, go away and try to solve all 75 puzzles. Stock up on food. <laughs> it is not easy. Okay. Um, you can spend the many transatlantic flights trying to solve these problems. OK, they get very, very difficult. Um, Although you don't have to play it that way. Because what goes on is, if you simply want to, re to, to, to release the was it, this is multi-threaded play. If you want to simply, re it's enough to just get the keys. So you can simply collect the keys, and you can do it in very naive fashion. But one of the things the game wants you to do is get maximum points by minimizing, and get maximum stars by minimizing the number of moves. So very quickly, you realize that if you want to do well, you have to solve the problem in the least number of moves, or close to the least number of moves. This is the keyboard. This is how we're going to play the thing. Very simple keyboard for the first one. That's the music. Because this is a representation of a whole area of mathematics, essentially integer arithmetic. Okay, this is a, a way of representing, instead of x's and y's and z's with coefficients, we've got numbers on this cog. So in a sense, this is getting right into the numbers because the numbers are being represented mechanically. So that's the analog, and this is the game that we can play. When you go a little bit, that was the one we just saw played. This is the next one you'll meet. Now here you've got three keys. Resolution is not, actually this is a frozen screen, so I don't worry about the resolution. It's just the way it was frozen. You've got three keys here, one on 10, one 15, and one on 20. And you've still got one drive cog of five. One thing you could do is you could say, OK, in the previous game, I realized I could move it twice. I could, I could collect one key, one move, 
do the five, get a second key. So in three moves, I could collect the three keys. If you do that, you find you don't get three stars, you don't get maximum points. You have to realize that there's a more efficient way of doing it. We don't tell people this. This is, a, this is all discovery learning. What you realize is this. Now we've got all these stars. Rescued the wizard. Um, and we're only on the third game. And already we're putting a whole bunch of things together. We're putting things in the right order, using the distributive law. We're doing some pretty sophisticated stuff. We're actually doing the stuff that those kids were doing in the marketplace that they'd picked up. And we're doing it in a meaningful, contextual way. Well, you play on, you play on, you learn more things. And eventually, if you can get through it, you reach the third level. This, the, the, the release version of our game has three levels, 25 puzzles in each. And then in the third one, just over halfway through, you meet this. Okay. Well, things are a bit more complicated now. We've got four cogs. We've got one, two, three, four keys. And we have three other bonus items. There are various items you can collect, some of which are valuable and, and, and things you want. Some of them are sort of dangerous items that you want to leave alone. Um, so now you've got to negotiate, you thread your way through this. To get the maximum score, you have to collect all of the bonus items and free the wuzzits, which means you have to collect all the four keys and the three bonus items. But if you, by the time, when, you when you've collected the fourth key, the game's over because the wuzzit's been freed. So you have to sequence things in a way where you can pick up the bonus items before you hit the last key. This gets fiendishly difficult. Fiendishly difficult. And um, I will, so, so now we're at Carnegie Hall. And what you do in Carnegie Hall, you practice first, and then you show off what you've learned. Um, that's not the way you play, because the idea is you play this, right? You, you experiment, you get better, and you, you reason it out. But just to sort of show you how this one works, um, here we go. This is how you solve this one. of applause, that's my solution, come on. <laughs> um, okay, um, there's clearly a, a lot of thought has to go into working these solutions. As you, get, as you work your way, and this is through the last level of the, of the puzzle. If you want to maximize your score, if you simply wanted to collect the, the, the keys and free the wuzzits, you could do that. So for someone who simply wants to go through the game, sort of a child learning arithmetic, not worried about the optimal points, then they can play all the way through and get practice at just basic arithmetic. It's, it's like all of the other games provide. But what makes it interesting is when you have the optimizations thrown in, is that there's a, then you've got a challenge. Then you've got to really think about it. You've got to look for patterns. You know, is, there a, is, is, there, is there an increasing sequence? Is there a little arithmetic progression in there that you can sweep through? So you've got to be looking for number patterns represented on that wheel. So it's, um, it gets challenging. Uh, but we know from letting people play it that they spend time playing it. Kids actually get engrossed in it. We actually have videotapes that we've got, internal videotapes, but of kids playing with their parents. And it's, it's, it's kind of nice to watch. Um, you know, to anyone who likes games and puzzles, these can be very captivating. So this is an example of one. We, we've got others that we've designed, but we haven't sort of built yet. But this is the first one that came out of the gate. It's only six weeks out of the, out of the gate. Um, it's an instrument. This is a representation of the mathematics. 
or at least it's a platform on which you can represent mathematics. Instead of x's and y's and z's, you've got the, the four different parameters and you've got the targets you're trying to hit. That's the keyboard. That's the music. You don't need to change the kind of keyboard. I mean, for, for reasons of space, we don't have all of these things numbered up. We just have th three or four that you need at a time, two, three, or four. So we actually change the numbers, but it's basically the same keyboard. It's a slice of a keyboard, if you like. And then the music, the things that force you to play in different orders, is where the keys go and what the various, uh, the various values are. So it really is like putting a tune, and you can change the tune. In fact, once you've built it, it's really easy to sort of build new tunes because you can do these. In fact, you know, kids could be able to play, design their own tunes. It's just a representation system. So it's not that we've taken mathematical problems and puzzles and built a game around them. The game is a framework within which you can represent lots and lots of mathematical puzzles. If it's simple sort of arithmetic, integer arithmetic, then you can represent it in this fashion. So you've got a whole swathe there. And that's the design principle that we've been looking at for how to build games. <laughs> we're not the only ones doing this kind of thing, but we're almost the only ones. Um, there's a general group, and there's maybe a couple more that are sort of floating around, um, that to some degree are doing something similar. Not quite. This is a nice one that does algebra. The interesting thing about that is it actually, what it does is it takes classical symbolic algebra and replaces the symbols. This is the equal sign. That's the left-hand side. That's the right-hand side. And it replaces the symbols by little diagrams. Uh, and cognitively, that makes it a little bit more. Whether that's a game is another issue. Um, it's certainly an entertaining learning app. But the interesting thing about that is that it's, it actually is about symbolic manipulation. So what they did, this is, came out of Norway, they took the classical representation and turned that representation into a game. Um, whereas we sort of bypassed the representation, other than using the, the, the digits, we bypassed the representation and went into the numbers implemented in terms of mechanics. Um, this is another one that came out of Stanford, Stanford Graduate School of Education. That's about getting a sense of the number line, ordering numbers on the number line, on the unit interval or whatever, and you do it by moving the device, the iPhone or, or even the iPad, you move that device, and so you get a tactile interface. Um, Clearly, it's locked into what it does. Um, this one came out of a company called Mind Research in Santa Ana. Um, interesting puzzle. Again, actually, it's, again, this is not sort of not a game. It's a learning app. It's, there's, there's a, if you work, I, mean, I, I spent several years before we founded this company. I spent several years working with a game studio on a, on a project, and so having spent some time with professional game developers that develop entertainment games, they would say that this is a game and that that's a game, and the other three they would say is not a game, because of the various elements it has. Um, you know, most people just, you know, they're, they're fun and you, and you play and you learn stuff. This one came out of the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, very nice game. Uh, to do with, well, it's actually to do with fractions. It's a, it's a rather nice play on the word with fractions. Um, that has a sort of a, a lot of elements of, of gameplay to it, uh, although they haven't made that into a, a sort of a, a general release game. It's just a free download that you can get. So there are sort of other people doing something like this. Um, the goal that we have, and it's a kind of different, people have different goals. Our goal actually was to sort of make a game that actually is a game. It stands alone as a game. Um, in other words, it's, the learning is there, and the, the learning is deliberate, but it's like a piano. You know, a piano, you, people don't build pianos just to learn music. They play pianos to play on. And by the way, if you play on them, you learn it. And that was sort of in, in, in our idea of the, of, the, of the piano, was that this is developed not as a game to learn mathematics, although that's certainly in the back of my mind. We designed it to try and be a fun game that could be played by people who didn't think of it in that way. So like any instrument, it's up to the individual how they, how they play with it. Okay. Um, if you want more information, um, there's a book I wrote a few years ago. Um, it was actually about PC games and console games. Um, and it was just when this came out, just when mobile games took off. But many of the principles still, still hold true. 
Uh, there's a picture of the, the front page that we've seen. And there's a little uh, sample of the thing. And if you want more information in general, there's, the, there's some stuff and some videos on the, on the website. Um, I've got a blog. The first of those blogs is actually a lot of it's about game development. Um, I'm also giving massive online courses that are actually very similar. They're about the, the, the massive online course I'm giving is called Mathematical Thinking. It's about thinking mathematically rather than manipulating symbols. Um, interesting to watch the students' reactions to that. I mean, there's 55,000 of them signed up at the moment. So they're not all online, but, uh, but quite a lot of them are. Um, and it's, uh, uh, what's particularly interesting is actually people realizing, often people well on in their careers and sometimes retired people, sort of realizing that, yeah, mathematical thinking is separate from the, symbol, the symbolism. For a lot of it, you need the symbol. For a lot of it, you don't. But it's still a different activity. And the role of symbols in mathematical thinking is, is a really interesting one. Okay. Um, so there's another blog called MOOC Talk where I discuss that. And then I've got a column for the MAA on, in a blog format where I discuss all sorts of things to do with mathematics. So if you're interested in finding more stuff, there are lots of references that you can look for. Uh, that's the end of the presentation. And the idea of actually, you know, the idea of giving a talk on a video game, it's kind of weird, right? I mean, it really is kind of weird because really what you should do is play it, right? I mean, th these things are to be played. Download it, it's free. There's a free, you can, you can download it free at the App Store. You can download a version, for, for an Android version when it's available. We hope it's going to be available soon. We're, we're working on it, we're getting close to things. So you can get the, the free download. These things, it's like a piano. You, you, it's much more fun to go into a room with a piano and play the piano. You don't want to lecture on it. So you know, we've got a lecture format. I get paid to lecture. You know, I'm a professor, so I get paid by the minute almost to, to lecture. Um, you know, but the reason you know, lectures tend to be long, because we sort of think that we've been paid by the minute. Um, again, it's part of historical. But let, I mean, let's not forget that the reason lectures were invented in the first place was because people needed to distribute written language, texts. I mean, the lecture was basically the original photocopy machine. I mean, you, you went into a monastery and someone read the book and wrote the book up and 20 people made copies. So you have 20 copies instantly and then they went away and did it. So the fact that the lecture still survives several thousand years later is kind of interesting. Um, but, uh, so you know, don't take my word for it. Go and play the thing and see how you, how you get on. And, uh, and if you solve all the three levels and get 75 puzzles with three stars, drop me an email. I'll send you a free book or something. OK. Uh, OK, thank you. <laughs> the problem with people, like most of the people in this room, I suspect, is we will get hung up on the fact that we want to get three stars on every puzzle. That is dangerous. The optimal strategy is to play through and get a sense of it. In other words, do as we normally say, not as we do. But I must admit, I play puzzles, these interesting puzzles, and I stick on one until I've solved that sucker. You know I mean? um, and so uh, it could take you a long time that way, but uh, it's, 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 it's challenging. It's, I think it's impossible. If you, if you like mathematics and thinking and puzzles, I would be amazed if you didn't get hooked on this. So make sure your marital state's in good shape before you do this. If you have a spouse who's not numerically minded, turn the volume off and go away quietly and play it. Because they are, they are addictive. We do know this is addictive because lots of people wrote and told us that, wrote reviews and things. A few times, a little note will come up and say, look for patterns. Uh, look for, for various number of patterns. One of the things we do, and, and it's part of just game development, is when you start something new, you provide some problems where you're almost giving the answer. You can, you know, there, there might be one where um, you, perhaps you have, you, you have three, you might have three keys, each seven apart, but the first one is on number 10. So you have to realize that the optimal strategy is to go for 10 at no value and then sweep through the other three, and you can do it in two moves. So we, we, we set them up so that there are very obvious patterns when you see them, if you look for the patterns, and then you can just do an initial move. Um, you may have noticed that there's a parity switch at zero. It goes from zero through to 65. So if you have a problem that has even and odd numbers, 
you can deal with that by going counterclockwise. I shouldn't have told you that. I should let you fix it, right? Yeah, the idea, I mean, we, you don't want to give the game away, but although the reality is, you know, the game's been out now six weeks. Um, it's not going to be long before there are websites up there where people have cheat sheets and things. So, I mean, that's just the way these things go. Um, you know, it, and eventually, people are going to start posting their solutions and putting YouTube videos. There's already been some YouTube videos floating around. So, you know, that, that's all going to get out. But, um, but we do, as, as good game de design is, we, um, we, we, we try to make sure that the first few examples, the sort of easy ones, where, where it shows that the kind of thing you do, and then you launch up into more difficult ones. But it's essentially to just play with and explore. It really is just like having a, a piano. In fact, one of the things we did very early on in our development, we took this into a middle school actually down in Los Angeles, um, actually younger than middle school, I think there were sort of seventh or eighth graders. But we went down with a team, and we had an early version of these on, on laptops around the edge of the room, and we were talking to the teachers and the, some of the kids, and the, the games were just there. We didn't ask the kids to play them, but you know, these kids were listening to these grown-ups talking about arithmetic and teaching and mathematics and things, and there were these games twinkling in the edges there. So, of course, they went over and started playing them, and it was only a few minutes before they were saying, you know, I've finished this one, you know, how do I get the next one? Because the interface wasn't very good at that stage. So the kids were just captivated. Um, and the teachers would have been captivated, but they didn't want to do that in front of anybody else. Um, but because there's real mathematics beneath this, uh, it's hard not to be captivated if you like the numerical stuff. And of course, all of the bells and whistles and the, the, the sounds and the part of the interface, that makes it attractive to people who don't think of themselves as numerical and arithmetical. But we know from that work in Recife that practically everybody does have the capacity for sophisticated mathematical reasoning. So it's not that people don't have the capacity, it's an interface issue. So in principle, if you can provide the right kind of interface, you can capture everybody. There's a big phenomenon, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize that. There's a phenomenon in education known as the transfer problem. And it's to do with the way that we, the human cognitive system works. If you learn something, it's, almost, it's, in, it's in, 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 unavoidably locked into the context in which you learn it. You know, the classic case for those of us who teach mathematics is we teach people you know, solving linear equations, and then the next session is physics, and they magically forget how to solve the equation in the physics class. And that's not because they're stupid, it's because you made a bad job, it's because of the way the mind works. It's sort of locked in, and transfer from learning in one context to another one is difficult. Okay, now there's two things you could go on here. I would say, if I was hiring people, and I wanted them to have really good mental arithmetic skills with, with whole numbers, if they could play through this game and get three stars on all levels, I would hire them. They have absolutely demonstrated full mastery. Now, of course, they haven't passed the school test, which is done differently. So the question is then, if you're doing this in the educational system, and we're, you know, as I said, we're conceiving of this just as a game. We're not trying to sell it to schools. We're not trying to sell it to anybody at the moment. But the idea is we're putting it out as a game, which has educational potential. Mm -hmm.